problem. Uh, chapter 11, oscillations and waves. This is our last chapter before test number three. And uh, this is just a really brief introduction uh, to both oscillations and waves. Uh, we're not going to really go deep into waves like uh, at all because it's just really not enough time to practice on interference, diffraction, and stuff like that. So uh, the, the the deeper you go into physics, the more uh, add-ons you'll see in this part for sure because uh, for, say, oscillations that have uh, damping, the some friction involved, uh, you'll see a much more complicated uh, solutions. And uh, this time, no friction, no damping, just simple harmonic motion and simple has the has it also. Simple means it's going to be simple, no, not too hard. Uh, and oscillations, of course, are very important for real life. Every time you try to fight with earthquakes, you want to predict how a building can you know, survive an earthquake or uh, pendulums, uh, or you go to biology and you think spider webs that uh, oscillate when the prey hits it. So a lot of processes and applications uh, can be thought when you when you when you hit the oscillations. And uh, once there is an oscillation, you should consider waves, uh, especially when you have uh, some kind of medium like an air. Uh, so medium is going to oscillate and the wave will propagate in a certain direction, in a certain way. And those basic parameters like uh, uh, wavelength, frequency, the, the speed of propagation, those are very important parameters that uh, you have to uh, understand in order to describe the, the nature of those uh, phenomena. So simple harmonic motion, SHM. Uh, this is going to be the lab also that we're going to do. Uh, so you will see uh, how uh, theory uh, meets the uh, experiment, and you'll see for yourself how uh, different parameters depend on each other. And uh, simple harmonic motion is your foundation, uh, the first level of difficulty, if you will. And on top of simple harmonic motion, you can uh, put other things like friction and make it more complicated, but make it more real in terms of real life. So um, consider periodic motion when you oscillate uh, over the same trajectory and it takes the same amount of time to uh, complete something once, like motion back and forth, like one complete oscillation, or if it's uh, some kind of a... Uh, revolution, rotation process, then one complete revolution would be your uh, one period. Uh, so uh, the example that we will discuss now is the mass attached to a spring and it oscillates on a frictionless surface. So no damping, no slowing down. Uh, and let's we discuss the uh, basic parameters for such a motion. So this is your mass, M, attached to a spring. Spring is connected to the wall. So the mass, mass is going to oscillate back and forth. And uh, there is a very special point that we call equilibrium position. When the spring is neither stretched or compressed, and every time you have your mass to to the right of that position, you see there is some stretching. 
And uh, you can describe that with the Hooke's law, the force of a spring uh, connected to the stiffness of a spring and the certain extension. And if your object is to the left of equilibrium position, then you have compression and there is still the spring force and there is still the same stiffness that you have to keep in mind the constant for a spring and the change in uh, length of a spring uh, is also present for the Hooke's law uh, that defines the force, the spring force. This thing we already discussed. So now uh, it is time to look at other parameters. So Hooke's law, the spring force, negative, uh, some kind of a coefficient times the uh, extension or compression. Uh, units are newtons, meters, and for k, you're going to get newton meters, newton, newtons divided by meters. Uh, you see the negative sign, which shows the direction for the force. The force is also, uh, it's very important that, see how you have change in x in one direction and force is trying to bring the whole thing, the, the system back to its original equilibrium position. And if X is negative, then force is positive. So opposite direction, once again, the nature of force is described uh, with this negative sign as a restoring force. So mass is trying to go back to its equilibrium position. Now, um, is this force constant? Will that force produce constant acceleration? Of course not, because the more the extension or compression, the more delta x you have, the stronger the force uh, will be present. So the force is not constant. Force changes with uh, displacement. And therefore, force not being constant, the second Newton's law of equals ma, produces a statement that acceleration is not constant, which is a problem for our kinematics approach. Remember, for kinematics, we used a special set of equations when acceleration was considered constant. And if acceleration is not constant, then you can't use those two equations. So that's a problem. And uh, uh, your best way to solve such problems would be either the calculus approach, when you have derivatives and antiderivatives, which we, of course, haven't discussed yet and will not discuss in this class, or try to implement the conservation principles, specifically conservation of energy, because there is some kind of motion. Uh, you will get, uh, if there is motion, there is kinetic energy. And if there is no motion, say maximum compression, maximum stretching, you hit the uh, point when the object momentarily stops. So all the energy is going to be potential. And this time it's not gravitational potential, it's elastic potential. The one half kx squared, if you don't remember, that would be your expression to work with. And the oscillating object will convert its elastic potential into kinetic and then back to elastic potential and back to kinetic. And that motion uh, goes on and on and on. So uh, overall energy stays uh, at a constant value. Energy is conserved. And you can do some calculations on either how fast it goes or how much of a compression or stretching we have or the force itself. So uh, conservation of energy is definitely on the table. Uh, because you really can't do much uh, in terms of dynamics, in, term, uh, in terms of the second Newton's law. Uh, everything changes, and uh, you have to go through conservation of energy. <clears throat> so maximum displacement when object momentarily stops is called amplitude. Amplitude is the amount of stretching or compression in meters. And uh, amplitude would be the first number that you'll see in a position equation, which we will 
discuss later. For now, uh, <clears throat> understand that uh, an object would go through uh, a distance equal to two times the amplitude. It will go from negative A to equilibrium, and then from equilibrium all the way to the positive A. So one complete uh, oscillation uh, will include double the amplitude in one direction and double the amplitude in the opposite direction. <clears throat> so if A is, I don't know, five meters, then you're gonna go from negative five to zero and from zero to positive five, and then from positive five back to zero and to negative five again. So that would be the change in position. <laughs> Um, so one cycle is what we call the motion from initial point back to the same point. So A to B to C, back to equilibrium at D, and back to the original point in the diagram E. So this is your cycle. And period is the time that it takes you to complete one cycle, and frequency is the inverse of a period. Remember, every time you have frequency being given as revolutions per minute, per second, you can think about a certain time associated with that frequency and vice versa. If time is given, then the inverse of that special time for one complete cycle is the frequency. So period is the inverse of frequency and frequency is the inverse of a period. Uh, be careful with units. Time must be in seconds, so frequency would be the inverse of a second, which we call hertz. And uh, you should operate with seconds, not minutes, not hours, none of that. Uh, so for the lab, uh, there will be a vertical motion. So uh, your mass will be attached to a spring, and the spring is going to stretch under the gravity of the mass attached. And then it's going to oscillate up and down, and, and you'll measure the parameters, measure the period, measure the stretching. So the initial setup for equilibrium would be the balance between the gravity and the spring force for the initial stretching. See how the uh, spring by itself with no mass has this equilibrium position, but once you introduce the mass to the spring, it's going to be uh, a different equilibrium, and you're going to measure everything from uh, this reference point. So, uh, and how can you figure out the reference point? You have to find that sweet spot where the the gravity is completely balanced by the spring force. So you say uh, Kx on one side equals to Mg on the other side, and you can solve for uh, the missing parameters right away. So Hooke's law versus the pool of gravity. This is your uh, initial setup for the lab. So every time you have a restoring force, which means the force is going to try to uh, put you back to equilibrium position, uh, is proportional to the negative of displacement, then you have a case that you call simple harmonic motion. The definition for simple harmonic motion is when the force is directly proportional to the negative of displacement. So what do we have for this case? We have force negative displacement, and then there's a K, which is a coefficient of uh, proportionality, if you will. So if it's negative and displacement and the coefficient in between that describes the restoring force, then it's a simple harmonic motion case. The system is called simple harmonic oscillator, but the point is you can apply all of those equations that we are about to discuss. <clears throat> and uh, of course, it's the energy approach, which is your best friend, because once again, for dynamics, 
you can't say uh, anything in uh, kinematics because we discuss only cases when acceleration is constant. And dynamics is also mm, not on the table because forces uh, change, accelerations change, and uh, the only way to solve such conditions would be with a calculus approach, which you will learn at the next level of physics. You take uh, calculus-based physics, you will be able to solve that without energy approach. But this time it is the conservation of energy. And I've mentioned that it's going to be uh, a constant conversion between elastic potential energy and kinetic energy. So how much for the potential? It's one half kx squared. We derived it before. You can think about this as an average value. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a triangle as a diagram is force per force force versus displacement and the graph is a, a slanted line and you find the area below that curve and that would be the value for the work done by that force or the change in potential energy so one half kx squared is your potential energy and one half mv squared, as usual, your kinetic energy of motion with no friction, and our model implies no friction. You say that mechanical energy is conserved, k plus u equals k plus u at any moment of time, at every point. So uh, one half mv squared plus one half kx squared is a conserved constant value for any oscillating system. And uh, this is how you're going to solve pretty much the majority of simple harmonic motion problems. Uh, if it's maximum stretch or maximum compression, the A or C diagrams, you see the uh, energy diagram, it's all potential. Those blue uh, bars represent potential energy, zero kinetic. And once you hit the equilibrium point, what do you have? You are at equilibrium, that means zero stretching, zero compression. So if X is zero, then potential energy is zero. So there is no potential, it's all kinetic. So once again, maximum compression, maximum stretching, it's all potential energy. One half kx squared, and instead of x, you can put your value for the amplitude. Amplitude describes the maximum compression and stretching. And once you hit the equilibrium point, it's all kinetic. There's no potential. You say one half mv squared maximum. Maximum speed happens at the equilibrium point. So all potential or all kinetic, uh, those are three positions that we're going to use to solve for any of the parameters that are missing in the problem. So it's not just kx squared. You can put 1 half ka squared, a being the amplitude and uh, the total amount of energy stored in the system can be connected to amplitude as one half ka squared, um, which you can use for everything in the middle. Say you are somewhere in the middle between equilibrium and the maximum. So you say somewhere in the middle, you have both kinetic and potential energy, and you can set it equal to one half ka squared or one half mv maximum squared, depending on what's given, depending on what's missing. Your total energy is either maximum potential, which is here, or maximum kinetic, that would be one half mv maximum squared. <clears throat> yeah, so if you are somewhere in between, you have both types and you set it equal to the total amount of energy. 
And then you can solve for whatever is missing. Say, uh, I want to transfer kx squared to the other side and solve for uh, the speed. Not a problem. Uh, first of all, you multiply both sides by 2, get rid of 1 half. Uh, kx squared goes to the other side with a negative sign. And then you divide by the mass, factor out the k, and that's what you're going to get, uh, which is so solution for v squared. We don't want v squared, we want just v, so you have to take the radical on both sides. And... Uh, and let's say you are at equilibrium, then you will not have any x's. x would be just 0. 0 over something is just 0. 1 take away 0 is just 1. This would be the shortcut for you to solve for the maximum speed. At any moment of time, once you hit the equilibrium, you have maximum kinetic, 0 potential, and maximum speed is this much. Uh, and if you want the general solution, so taking the radical on both sides, that's what you're going to get. See how it says plus or minus because you can be going in both directions. Velocity is a vector. Be careful whether it's moving to the left, moving to the right. Uh, you have two options. Uh, keep that in mind as well. And of course, for figuring out plus or minus, you will need extra conditions. Uh, just watch for those conditions. If it's just the magnitude, then you don't have to say plus or a minus. You can just keep it as a certain value, and that's it. So this is the result for the velocity. Why is that so? Because conservation of energy says so. You really don't have to remember any of those formulas because it's an easy derivation from the general conservation of energy principle. The conservation of energy is what you have to uh, work with at all times. So this would be your bread and butter for solving uh, simple harmonic motion. OK, quick question for practice. There is a block with kinetic energy of 3 joules. Spring has an elastic potential energy when the block is somewhere between equilibrium and see how it's a plus. So between the maximum stretching, so somewhere here. What is the kinetic energy when block is at equilibrium? Well, if it's at equilibrium, what do we say? It's all kinetic. There is no elastic potential. Let's go back to our equation, it's 1 half kA squared as a total energy. And if it's at equilibrium, it's all kinetic energy, 1 half mV squared max. So at equilibrium, it's all kinetic, zero stretching, zero potential. And uh, that that, kin that maximum kinetic means the total energy stored in the system. How much energy do we have? We have kinetic of 3 and potential of 2. So the total mechanical energy is 5 joules. So it's 5 joules here. It's 5 joules there. It's 5 joules everywhere. Once again, why is that so? Because we don't have friction. With no friction, mechanical energy is conserved, and you'll get 5 joules everywhere. Uh, in between uh, oscillations, oscillation positions. So the answer is 5 joules. Because it's kinetic plus potential. OK, same setup. The question is, what is elastic potential when the block is at a negative 2 centimeters. So everything is given for positive 2 centimeters. Now how about negative 2 centimeters? What if the block is uh, symmetrically on the other side? What's the, what's the value for uh, potential energy? Well, what's the potential energy calculations? It's 1 half kx squared. And he, see how x goes squared. If it's positive or negative, it doesn't matter. 
one, two, one, two, sorry, the headset turned off. So one half Kx squared, that's your potential energy. And no matter if X is positive or negative, you square it and that becomes positive anyways. And stiffness, the, the coefficient of a spring is also a positive number no matter what. So either way, one half Kx squared will give you the same value. Positive or negative, that will become positive and you will get the exactly the same value. So if it was two joules of potential energy on one side, then if it's the same distance, same stretching or same compression on the other side, you get two joules once again, because it's the same one half Kx squared and squaring something gives you a positive value no matter what. This should make sense. And uh, one more question with the same setup. Uh, what is the elastic when the block is at a maximum stretching? So the block has moved to the negative XM. The value is the amplitude, of course. So you, you can say amplitude minus amplitude and plus amplitude. So we are at a maximum compression. Well, maximum compression means what? You momentarily stop and there is no kinetic energy. It's all potential. And uh, we remember that the total amount of energy is still five joules and with no friction, the total amount of energy is conserved. That's why it's the same five joules, uh, no matter where you are, once again. If you are here, it's five joules. If you're there, it's five joules. The total energy is always five joules. And if there is no kinetic energy, it's all potential. So you're answering the question right away. Potential energy is five joules at the maximum compression or maximum stretching. In between, you have both kinetic and potential. But at the maximum values, stretching or compression, you will get your um, five joules for potential energy. Okay, um, another case for SHM, which is uh, probably not obvious right away, but you have to recall rotation. Here is a mass, maybe on a string that rotates uh, on a table, like there's a tabletop and the mass is attached to a string and uh, revolves uh, with respect to some kind of a center of that circle. The radius is capital A and the motion is uniform. So the, the magnitude of velocity stays constant. So you have the velocity vector, which is tangent to the trajectory, and then you have the horizontal component of that velocity with respect to the x and y uh, coordinate system that is shown. So this is the top view, and what's shown here is the side view. You can see that the velocity vector here uh, is connected to the x-axis, and the amplitude is your a distance. It's the distance that connects the mass with the center of rotation. So this is the setup. Uh, let's take a look at two triangles. The first triangle is a triangle that is made of two velocity uh, vectors. And uh, the line that connects the change, like the vertical component, this is horizontal component, this is vertical component, and that's the hypotenuse. Versus this triangle, where you have uh, A as hypotenuse, X is the current horizontal um, displacement, and the other side has the radical A squared minus X squared, because it's the, it's the Pythagorean theorem that says that side squared plus side squared gives you hypotenuse squared. So you have this much of a value for this side that is opposite to the reference angle theta. Uh, two triangles are similar 
they're not congruent, but they're similar because 90 degrees, 90 degrees, theta, theta, and the remaining would be 90 minus theta and 90 minus theta there. So three angles are congruent. Triangles are similar. And what do we know about similar triangles? We know that angles are uh, congruent and similar triangles, and the sides of those triangles will be similar too. So V with respect to V max is the same as uh, the radical A squared minus X squared, so opposite to the hypotenuse. See how V is the opposite side with respect to theta, and V max is hypotenuse. And uh, this side is also opposite to theta, and A is the hypotenuse, so two triangles that are similar will have similar sides and the ratio between those sides is the same. This is just basic geometry. It's you know, just, just the property of any similar triangles. And why are they similar once again? Because three angles are congruent. Uh, you can solve this as cross multiplication. If you ever heard about cross multiplication, you can do the V times A and V max times the radical and uh, solve for v, solve for v, you will end up with this little expression, which you should say, oh, I've seen that before. And that, that would be a correct statement because in section 11-2, we got the same result. And this result corresponds to the conservation of energy from what? from a simple harmonic motion. Energy in simple harmonic motion has this solution for velocity. And every time you get this result for velocity, you automatically have a case for simple harmonic motion. Your <clears throat> x component with respect to the uh, a value and considering the two velocity vectors shown on this diagram, uh, produce the oscillation that you can see from the side view, that mass would go back and forth uh, with respect to the x-axis. Uh, and you will uh, see the simple harmonic motion on the table. What you see from the top view would be the rotation. But the side view will be the simple harmonic motion, uh, which you can describe with the same equations. So what are the parameters to describe? First parameter is the period and therefore the frequency. Your uh, speed is distance with respect to time. How much of a distance do we travel through? It's one circumference for one complete revolution. It's two pi r and radius is a, so it's 2 pi a, 2 pi a for the circumference. And how much of a time do we need to complete one revolution? That's the period. The special time is the period. So you can solve for either the period or the frequency. You can see the uh, frequency instead of the period. Uh, and remember, frequency is the inverse of a period. So if you're dividing by a period, it means you're going to multiply by frequency. If you want to divide by frequency, it means multiply by a period. Vice versa also works. <clears throat> so dividing by a period means multiplying by frequency. And from the other hand, remember the uh, Vmax formula that we got from the same analysis in 11-2. So borrowing this result for our solution for Vmax, plug it into the velocity, gives you the very useful equation for the period, which connects uh, time to the mass. And uh, uh, remember how K was the stiffness of a spring. Now it's just a coefficient that you can introduce for the force versus uh, displacement ratio just by itself. 
So period and the inverse would be the frequency depends on the mass and the spring stiffness constant, but not the amplitude. One of the facts that we will um, study in the lab, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to show you the same experiment with different amplitudes, and we're going to measure the time for the whole process. And you will see for yourself that no matter what the amplitude, the timing for the process is the same, which is definitely not an obvious result. And it's your wow moment from the lab once you realize that the time is the same, no matter what the amplitude is. But it makes sense because... Uh, Theoretical predictions say that the time only depends on the mass and the parameter of the spring, the stiffness, not the amplitude, and the frequency as well, of course. Um, okay, time for uh, figuring out the position, velocity, and acceleration. Uh, like I said, everything's going to change. You can't use kinematics uh, that we did before. And uh, we have to introduce something new. Uh, we will introduce it through basic trig that you see in uh, the, the table setup. What is a, a reference angle? What's the cosine of it? It's the adjacent side, which is your x uh, position with respect to the hypotenuse, which is A. So X with respect, X over A is the cosine of the reference angle. And let's recall the basic parameter from rotation. This is your, this was angular velocity as change in displacement, angular displacement with respect to time. Now it's not going to be angular velocity. It's going to be called angular frequency. Anyways, it's the same omega that you've seen before. So you just say omega, it's okay. And uh, if cosine theta is x over a, solving it for x gives you a cosine theta. So a cosine theta, and instead of theta, it's omega times t. So it's a cosine omega t. Solving the first one for x gives you a cosine theta. And theta... Uh, is connected as omega t. So a cosine omega t is your general equation for the position at any moment of time. So t is the reference moment of time. All you need is to know the amplitude for your oscillation and the angular frequency. It was angular velocity for rotation. Now for oscillations, it's angular frequency. Um, okay, uh, why is it 2 pi f? Let me go back here. What is your uh, omega for one complete revolution? That would be in radians, so it's 2 pi radians, and the moment of time would be one period, the capital T. So omega is 2 pi over capital T, and if you don't like period, if you want to connect it to frequency, it's the inverse of T. So you're dividing by the period, or you can multiply by the frequency. So either way, you can say it's A cosine 2 pi T over T, or uh, 2 pi T times the F. F is the frequency, and uh, T is the moment of time. And capital T is the period. The period is the time for one complete uh, revolution or one complete oscillation, one cycle for oscillation. Uh, depending on what's given, depending on what's missing, for the position at any moment of time, you would refer to one of those equations and figure out the missing parameters. <clears throat> um, Sometimes it's the graph that's going to be given, and you have to be able to read the graph in order to understand what is your A, what is the omega for what is called now angular frequency. And for a cosine, what do we know? Cosine of uh, 
of zero is one. So if your graph starts with maximum stretching or compression, then it's definitely a cosine function. And you just draw the regular cosine. Uh, reference points would be cosine of zero, cosine of say halfway through the period, and then cosine three, three quarters of a period, and then the whole period. Uh, sometimes the graph would look like this and see how it starts from zero. If you start from zero, then it's not a cosine because once again, cosine of zero is one. So you'll get maximum a stretch or maximum compression. But if the initial condition is just zero, zero, then it's not cosine. You have to go with the sine function because sine of zero is zero. So for such a graph, instead of a cosine function, you would say sine omega t and uh, go from there. So two options for two types of graphs. You're either going to start from the equilibrium or maximum compression or stretch. For equilibrium, you'll go with sine. For maximum compression and stretch, you'll go with cosine. For velocity and acceleration, let's take a look at our table setup one more time. What do we see? We see that the velocity component for our oscillation uh, analysis, it's the side that is opposite to theta, and the maximum speed is also shown. So how would you solve for V if you know the theta and V max? Well, it's the opposite to hypotenuse, so it's a sine function. So from the uh, table diagram, you can see that V is uh, hypotenuse V max times the sine of the reference angle theta. And what's even more important, if your X is to the right, you can see how it's pointing to the left. So you have to introduce a negative sign. Um, once you hit the calculus level, you will see that velocity is the derivative of position and derivative of uh, sine or cosine would be the, uh, it can be a negative value. So this negative just shows you how velocity is the derivative of the position. Uh, we're not really going to go deep into calculus, of course. I can't really tell you what to do here. I'm just showing you how you can still solve for all of those parameters, even if the force is not constant, acceleration is not constant, there is still a solution. Uh, for now, just understand that it's the sine function. And uh, for acceleration, because acceleration is force over mass and force is the uh, Hooke's law, and uh, k over m is just constant, and x is what? x is a cosine omega t. x is a cosine omega t. So instead of an x, you say a cosine omega t, and you're back to cosine function. Um, the better result comes from calculus analysis, but we're not doing any calculus. I'm just telling you what the solution is. Uh, keep it in mind, but I'm pretty sure uh, we're not going to do any 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 calculations of velocity and acceleration for this level. Uh, yeah, you can see that three graphs put together. What do you see? You start with maximum stretch, which means you have to deal with cosine, and it's a positive cosine. And then for velocity, you start from zero, which is a clear uh, sign that it's a sine function. And it's going in the negative direction. Because velocity is negative, it means negative direction. And acceleration is also negative. Uh, and once again, it's a cosine, because it starts with the maximum uh, compression. Uh, let's practice uh, our uh, calculations. We have 
simple harmonic motion, certain period is given, and we start from maximum compression. Negative xm means we are not at equilibrium, we are at the maximum uh, compression. So uh, are we at the same point, or are we at equilibrium, or are we at the maximum stretch, or somewhere in between when uh, the time of two periods passes by? Uh, so what is a period? A period is the time for one complete cycle. So let's say it's just one T, one capital T. Where are we? If you start from a certain position, then the definition for period says you have to go back to the same position. So you start from maximum compression after 1t, you will end up at the same point. So how about 2t? Well, same thing. It's just 1t plus another t. And after 1t, you go back to the same position. So after 2t's or 3t's or 5t's or 17 t's, you will still be at the same point. That's why for part A, the answer is the same point, maximum compression. It should make sense. How about three and a half t? Well, for three t, you already know. For three t, you will be at the same point because it's the definition for the period, for the t. But then there is a half of a t, and half means you have to uh, start from, from here. This is where we start from. And halfway over t, we are on the other side of uh, the oscillation. So one quarter is equilibrium, and another quarter, we are at the opposite side. And then three quarters, we go back to equilibrium, and four quarters, you go back to the original point. So half of a period corresponds to the maximum compression, oh, excuse me, stretching. So if we start from maximum compression, then it's maximum stretching after half of a period. So three periods, we are at the same point. But if it's three and a half, we are at the opposite point of maximum stretching. So we are at positive x max. This should make sense, right? And if it's five and a quarter of a period, well, five periods means we are at the same point. No matter how many periods, the period is the time to get to the same point. Uh, initial position. So if you start from negative XM, you go back to negative XM. And then there is an extra quarter of a period. Quarter of a period means we go to equilibrium. Once again, following the same diagram here, that's where you start from. And one quarter is equilibrium. Two quarters, which is half, we are on the other side. Three quarters, you go back to equilibrium. And four quarters, you go back to the original point. This should make sense. Um, one last setup for simple harmonic motion is the pendulum. And uh, it's some kind of a mass attached to a cord or a string and the cord doesn't stretch, and mass is, I can't say negligible, it's just a small mass, okay? There is a mass that uh, is attached, and uh, it's not a super-duper large mass. Not much of a uh, extension for the cord itself is expected. So what do we see? We see that there is gravity, and then there is tension force. Tension along the cord, rope, or a string, that's the property of a tension force. Every time there is a cord rope or a string, there is tension along those cords. And gravity is uh, pulling the mass towards the center of the Earth. 
and uh, the net force is what you have here and uh, it will be equal to mg sine theta <clears throat> so why like if see how the force is still mg there like there's a force and uh, there is uh, some kind of a uh, displacement well it's going to be angular displacement but still a displacement but the function is now a sine it's not just displacement by itself it's not just theta it's the sine of theta so can we say it's simple harmonic motion even though it's just it's a sine theta not theta by itself turns out that it's not a big deal as long as the reference angle is kept at a small values say 10 to 15 degrees uh, there is a little table that uh, you can find in a textbook and I'm showing it to you and you can see how theta in radians and we have to work with radians for angular displacements has pretty much the same value as the sine of theta at those small angles uh, of course once you hit like 30 degrees the difference is you know quite significant you have like 4.5 percent significant uh, 5 4.5 percent uh, discrepancy but up to 15 degrees it's only what one percent so for our purpose of analysis of simple harmonic motion we can say that uh, up to a certain small angle our sine theta is equal to is approximately is like really close to theta theta by itself and uh, if it was negative mg sine theta and you replace sine theta with theta by itself because of the small angle approximation you have the case when the force is restoring because it's negative and it's <clears throat> directly proportional to the displacement every time there is a negative displacement proportion you call it a simple harmonic motion case so a pendulum turns out to be a perfect well not perfect but uh, a really close approximation to a simple harmonic motion of course you have to neglect a resistance any drag force is not on the table and uh for the purpose of a simple harmonic motion the pendulum is a almost a perfect fit <clears throat> um, yeah once again small angle approximation uh, for uh, many applications in the military when you do the computer science coding uh, this is a very useful uh, approach as well because it takes more time for a machine to calculate a sine of an angle rather than the angle by itself and if you can replace your uh, values of sine with just values of theta you will save a lot of time in machine computation time and that will uh, allow the machine to process the code faster much faster and you know for military applications the the faster you work the faster the code works the better uh, the results are so small angle approximation is a very very useful thing keep that in mind for small angles theta in radians has the same almost the same value as the sine of theta so if theta is the arc length with respect to the radius that's just a definition of radian you can replace theta as this ratio and calculate the period as frequency as before remember it was 2 pi m over k your k turns out to be mg over l so replace the k with mg over l mass cancels fun fact of the day mass cancels and for the period it does not depend on mass it only depends on the length of the uh, cord and the free fall acceleration for a certain planet this is a very um, 
sneaky. One, two, one, two. Sorry, the heads have turned off again. Ah. So this is a very sneaky trick to pull out the free fall acceleration on any unknown planet or a comet or an asteroid. You land on that planet. And the very first thing you do, you set up a simple pendulum. You count uh, a certain amount of oscillations. You find the period. You know the length of the cord. Boom, you will figure out the free fall acceleration on that planet. And of course, for this lab, the, the simple harmonic motion, I will uh, perform the experiment and you'll see the, the experiment, you'll get the data. And your job would be to actually calculate the G on Earth. Uh, you already know that G is 9.8 meters per second per second. So go ahead and confirm that this formula is a real deal. Uh, from the experiment of a simple harmonic motion for a pendulum. It's just super cool how you can connect the free fall acceleration with the pendulum. There is no free fall here, right? There is no, uh, it's just oscillations and boom, you get a very important parameter for any, you know, planet, for any object in the universe. <clears throat> And frequency would be the inverse. So flip the 2 pi, flip the L and G. So it's now G over L. You can count how many times per second your pendulum will oscillate back and forth. Very, very interesting result from simple harmonic motion. Uh, okay, question for you. Uh, three pendulums of three different masses have the same shape, size, and suspended at the same point. Rank the masses according to the periods. Yeah, this is a trick question. You have the masses, but masses do what? They cancel. And you're only left with the length, the G, and the pi. Pi is constant, G is constant, and if it's the same length for all the pendulums, what do you make for a conclusion for the period? The periods are all the same. Mass does not affect the period, which is another interesting outcome for from the lab. Remember the first outcome was for amplitude that doesn't depend on the period. The amplitude is not uh, a part of that analysis. And also the mass is not a part of the analysis for the period of a pendulum. So yeah, free fall for any planet is found by measuring the period and the length of a simple pendulum. You can uh, figure out that uh, value right away. Oh, we actually have a section on damped harmonic motion. Let me take a quick look. Oh, but we don't have any formulas, good. So it's just the basic. Uh, introduction. We're not going to do any of those problems because see how the graph uh, changes. It's still like a sinusoidal or, co or cosine graph, but there are those uh, damped, damping limits. It becomes an exponent. So it's like a combo of exponent and the sine cosine graphs. Uh, the solution becomes really tricky. You have to do differential equations. So none of that. Real life systems are tricky because they do have friction and you have damping. And uh, we actually need that damping for many different things. Let's say uh, you have uh, earthquake protection for buildings. See those huge... Um, uh, cylinders that are connected to moving uh, pistons and uh, there, 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 there are springs that support the, the whole thing. So once the earthquake is in place, you don't want your building to uh, collapse from that earthquake. That building would rather also go back and forth until the earthquake stops and end up in the same position with... Uh, those uh, damping uh, systems in place. So critical damping is required for earthquake protection. Also car shock absorbers, if you hit um, a pothole, uh, 
uh, you don't want the whole car to just you know bounce in that direction. You uh, you want to install those absorbers to your wheels, and yes, the wheel will go up and down, but the car itself will stay stable, so you'll be able to drive uh, safely through the pothole. So, do we need damping? Yes. Uh, sometimes it's it's really the only thing that's going to save your life. And uh, you want to know how the whole thing is solved uh, for damped oscillations as well. But that requires a little extra understanding of mathematics. No formulas here, so we just move on to, uh, to the next section. Um, for resonance, uh, yeah, uh, think about a child on a swing. That's a classic example. Uh, there is a swing, there is a child on a swing, and the child swings back and forth. And here comes mom and dad, stands behind, and introduces an external force to that oscillation, to that uh, back and forth motion. What's going to happen to the child on a swing? The child is going to pick up some amplitude, and uh, at some point, he can actually... Uh, do the whole circle around the swing, and it's a it's a dangerous uh, result, right? So this is what we call resonance, when the frequency of an external force matches the natural frequency of a system. And of course, you don't need any damping, because if damping is not small, then uh, frequency would just, I mean, uh, friction will just add up. Uh, and uh, destroy the uh, the resonance. So be careful with uh, external forces being the same direction and magnitude as the natural frequency of a system. This is very crucial for, say, bridges, because if there is a, a wind blowing and the wind blows with certain frequency, and then the bridge also gain some oscillation from, say, cars moving on it. And if two frequencies match, then that bridge can enter the resonance and actually collapse. If you'll Google some pictures from the past, uh, bridges in the past didn't have much of a protection against this. And at some point, they just collapsed. It was just a horrible outcome from what looks to be just, you know, yeah, there's wind blowing, but not a big deal. But wind blowing with a certain uh, oscillation, the certain frequency can do a lot of damage. And it's not just bridges, it can be buildings as well. So this little equation for that resonant frequency is something you have to keep in mind if you are an engineer for uh, you know, civil purposes. Uh, yeah, small damping, you can go all the way to infinity in terms of the amplitude. Amplitude would reach very, very large uh, values. With large damping, it's not going to be that much of a problem. So um, damping systems are very useful for fighting against the resonance. Okay, now for waves, as I said before, uh, just basic introduction. There is much more to waves, like interference, diffraction, that I'm going to skip. Uh, we really don't have much time before the test, and you still have to do your homework. So uh, for all those purposes, for wave motion, I only have this slide for you to keep in mind. Just basic definitions. What is a wavelength? You see the distance between two consecutive uh, crests or troughs. Still an amplitude up and down. And how fast velocity, uh, how fast the, the, the wave propagates through a certain medium. The formula is the velocity is wavelength times the frequency. And you already know what the frequency is. It's how many times your wave goes up and down per unit of time. And lambda, the wavelength, is what is shown here. Uh, this is the just the parameter for a certain wave. You measure 
the distance between two consecutive crests or troughs or any two points with the same uh, position. And that's it. This is your wave velocity equation, which is also widely used for uh, describing uh, motion of light. Uh, I do have a problem on that for classroom discussion. So we'll go back to this formula for a very interesting application. So yes, we do have transversal. We have to have longitudinal waves. So lots of parameters, lots of uh, applications like sound waves. You can see how sound uh, creates like minimum and maximum and minimum and maximum. So compression, expansion, compression, expansion. This is your uh, up and down uh, analog for the wave propagating. And uh, yes, with earthquakes, if there is an earthquake, you see how fluid on top will uh, also allow waves to propagate and you know eventually hit the uh, hit the continents. Uh, this is also uh, physics that you have to use for oscillation and wave motion, but not for this lab. No, no other formulas other than just the speed of the wave and wavelength times the frequency. That's that's all I'm. Uh, I will I require for this introductory lab. Nothing, nothing else. Uh, yeah, this is motion on a string. Uh, you have either the tension in a string versus the parameters of a string or the uh, uh, elastic modulus or bulk modulus that we did for uh, elasticity problems. Uh, none of that is going to be on the test. So don't worry. Just for now, that's the only slide you have to be concerned for wave motion. We are really short on time, so that's all I'm asking for from waves. Um, yeah, even intensity and uh, uh, intensity is not also on the test. You will not see any problems. However, there's a lot of applications for uh, even astronomy class that I teach. I have a lot of things connected to intensity of certain radiation and radiation is light, and light is an electromagnetic wave. Surprise! Light, light is uh, light has properties of waves. From one part, it's the stream of particles, the photons. From the other part, it's from the other point of view, it is an electromagnetic wave. And for waves, you do have all those properties. Uh, this is not an astronomy class, and this is not advanced physics, so we're not going to uh, cover any of that on the test. You can see that. Uh, last five sections are out, but they're still on the menu. Once you hit the next level of physics, you will have to um, master the interference, diffraction, uh, reflection, and uh, refraction. There's refraction and reflection, it's two different things. Okay, for now, that's it for the lecture. Let me stop recording.